I'm Mark Golub. And in the news, our continuing coverage of the discussion over the Iran deal put forth by President Obama, the deal that the P5 plus one worked out with Iran, whereby Iran suspends much of its nuclear program for the next 10 to 15 years. In return, sanctions, economic sanctions, will bring are lifted and will bring billions of dollars into the Iranian economy. Uh, in the Jewish community, there's been enormous controversy uh, and a great deal of criticism of the deal. And in the Times of Israel, uh, there was a position paper put out immediately by the editor, uh, David Horowitz, who gave his 16 reasons why he opposes the deal between uh, P5 plus one and Iran. Here are some of the things that David Horowitz wrote. He wrote, he asks questions, 16, 16 questions. For example, has the Iranian regime been required to halt all uranium enrichment, including thousands of centrifuges spinning at its main Natanz enrichment facility? No. Has the Iranian regime been required to shut down and dismantle its Iraq heavy water reactor and plutonium production plant? No. Has the Iranian regime been required to shut down and dismantle the underground uranium enrichment facility it built secretly at Fordo? No. Has the Iranian regime been required to halt research and development of the faster centrifuges that will enable it to break out to the bomb far more rapidly than is currently the case? No. Has the Iranian regime been required to submit to quote, anywhere, anytime, unquote, inspections of any and all facilities suspected of engaging in rogue nuclear-related activity? No. Those are just some of the 16 questions that are, are asked by the Times of Israel. And again, the sense is that there was, at least in, in this presentation, some real problems with the Iranian deal. Well, for some reaction, we're very pleased to have on our phones from Israel, Raphael Aaron, the diplomatic correspondent of the Times of Israel. Raphael, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, Raphael, I should ask you in general whether you share some of the Times of Israel's criticism of the deal. In general, how do you view it? Yes, I have to say that uh, I agree uh, to a large extent with uh, the editor, David Horowitz. The deal is not a good deal from an Israeli perspective, or uh, in general, I would even say. And uh, it was great that you read these points. So basically, you know, uh, you spelled out some of the reasons why we're so unhappy about this deal. Yes. Look, in America, when you hear people argue for this deal, the argument is that if you have 10 to 15 years, you will gain much more information about the Iranian nuclear program. Iran will, because of the verification that people who support the plan believe will be in place, the verification will keep Iran from going nuclear in terms of weapons for the next 12, 15 years, and that maybe there can be a regime change in the next 15 years or, Israel, uh, or Iran will simply develop into a different kind of nation state. And that therefore, even though all you've done is delay, you've not prevented, but you've delayed the process, the delay has real merit and deserves support both in America, in Israel, and around the world. Raphael, what would you say to this? Yeah, I have to frankly say that I don't buy this argument because um, this is not just freezing an agreement in time. This is an agreement that at the end of it sees Iran as a legitimized nuclear threshold power that has been given a stamp of approval by the international community to keep on enriching as much uranium as they want, and, and that is one of the most problematic aspects. But uh, there are other... Um, arguments uh, that can be fielded against uh, this deal. Uh, and, and I would maybe sum it up like this. This deal focuses very much on the immediate present time, right on the here and now. Right now, the administration argues 
Iran was close to getting the bomb, and we are basically freezing them in time. We are forcing them to, you know, mothball some of the uh, advantage, advancements that they made from uh, nuclear enrichment is going to be scaled back, uh, and that's a good thing. However, uh, dramatically, this deal you know, ignores the past and it ignores the future. Mm-hmm. Let me quickly uh, explain what I mean. By uh, the terms of the agreement, if you read it, puts Iran and the P5 plus 1, the six Western powers, on an equal footing, basically suggesting that there are two parties to this conflict, to this nuclear standoff, and um, some kind of compromise has to be found. And as you said, you know, this is uh, better than nothing. In the meantime, we, you know, we make sure they don't get a bomb. Um, however, and this is the wrong way to approach that conflict with Iran. Iran um, is not an equal partner in the international community. Iran is a signatory of the non-nuclear proliferation treaty, the so-called NPT, and has violated that on various occasions, as it has violated six United Nations Security Council resolutions. Yes. So Iran is a violator of several uh, agreements, and therefore it shouldn't be that uh, it shouldn't be seen as two parties that need to find a compromise. Yes. Uh, the Iranians are uh, the the one party that needs to make concessions for the international community mm-hmm. to welcome them back mm-hmm. and, uh, and and grant them uh, sanctions relief. Mm-hmm. So by denying or by uh, allowing Iran to deny uh, its past as a violator of international agreements, um, it is giving Iran the chance to rewrite the narrative of the entire history of that nuclear standoff. Yeah. And that's problematic. Yes. Uh, this, you know, narrative is, is very problematic. So, so that's part number one. But more importantly, you can say, you know, the past is the past, let's move forward. More importantly, this deal um, all but ignores the, the, the future of, of, of uh, Iran and the Middle East. And uh, as uh, you spelled out, in 10, 15 years, this uh, um, cap on nuclear uh, activity is uh, sunsetting, as it's called. There's a sunset clause, which means uh, at some point this is going to this is going to end, and then Iran, if they stick to the deal, will be uh, a, 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 a legitimized uh, nuclear commercial power, and that's very problematic given the regime's uh, nature uh, that I don't need to, I think, spell out. Yes, I want to make sure though you clarify. When you say that at the end of the 15 years, after the sunset clause and this deal expires, it runs out, what do you mean when you say that Iran will become a nuclear, a legitimate nuclear power state? Are you saying that it will have, it will be, will have legitimacy in terms of peaceful nuclear power? Or are you suggesting that this deal somehow legitimizes Iran as a nuclear weapons state? No, it does not. No, it does uh, not. Iran remains a uh, signatory to the NPT, and therefore is not allowed to build nuclear so weapons. What, so Iran I don't, so what in the agreement that was signed uh, yesterday, yes. um, Iran states explicitly that it will not seek the development of nuclear okay. weapons. So, so what no, bothers you? Iranian politicians voice. What this deal does, it allows, after its sunset, Iran to enrich as much uranium as it needs. And, and, and you and I know that Iran doesn't have any use for highly enriched uranium. Um, it has no nuclear facilities that use um, highly enriched uranium for civilian purposes. The only reason why they would want to enrich uranium to a high degree is to use it uh, as a, a warhead for a nuclear weapon. Exactly. Uh, so, what's your view? What, what do you, when you, th- if I were in the streets of Israel, and I'm sure, by the way, in Israel as there is in America, there's difference of opinion, and sometimes American Jews or Americans in general have the sense that in Israel everybody thinks the same, which is just so is nonsense beyond belief. But acknowledging the fact that there are differences of opinion, is there? Do you feel, Raphael, an overall sentiment in Israel about this deal? Yes. I mean, uh, as, as you rightly point out, right, three Jews, four opinions. So uh, it's utter nonsense to say that Israel thinks and speaks in one voice. Uh, however, the nuclear deal is being rejected throughout. 
uh, there has rarely been so much consensus, yes. especially in the political class. Uh, the uh, opposition um, leader, leader of the opposition, Isaac Herzog, and even uh, another opposition leader um, from the Yeshapit party, ALAP, they have both come out swinging against their deal, totally backing the prime minister, which is uh, at this kind of consensus you rarely see in Israel, if ever. There's no other topic in Israel uh, that finds agreement across the board. However, having said that, not everybody in Israel would agree with uh, that op-ed from David Horowitz you referred to earlier. There are some, even though they're in the minority, but there are some analysts who say that that deal is a bad deal, but it's not as bad as it could have been, and we should not uh, uh, become hysterical. You know, everything is going to be fine. So mm-hmm. there is that minority voice that says it's a bad deal, but we can live with it okay. somehow. And what has this done, in your view, Raphael, to Benjamin Netanyahu's stature in this entire discussion? He was the driving force. He made this the most important issue of his uh, successive terms as Prime Minister of Israel. Does the does this in any way tarnish him that the United States did in fact go ahead and uh, sign this deal with Iran? Well, in the meantime, the opposition leaders that I just mentioned who are backing him on the facts, on the assessment of the deal, they're actually accusing him of um, preventing Israel from getting a better deal. They're saying that you took on um, that, uh, you know, you, you promised us to prevent um, Iran from becoming a nuclear weapon state, and here it is, a deal that you yourself say is paving the way to Iranian nuclear bombs. So you failed in your mission to prevent that from happening. Um, so the two opposition leaders back in that it's a bad deal, but then they throw a lot of mud at Netanyahu for, you know, not preventing that deal. We'll have to see how much of it sticks. In the meantime, it seems like a political ploy to kind of, uh, you know, say what they think about the deal without agreeing too much with Netanyahu, who obviously they need to oppose for political reasons. Yes, it um, doesn't... Then all elections inside, so it's going to be hard to see how the public is, uh, you know, is going to uh, view that. In yes. the meantime, and Netanyahu uh, feels the pressure, and he's been pointing out several times, including in the Knesset, um, that uh, he did everything possible. He was one of the first people in Israel to raise that concern about Iran, and that without his active lobbying against um, Iranian um, nuclearization, Iran would have by now had the bomb for a long time already. Yes. It does not seem to be fair criticism of Netanyahu that this deal was done, and I understand those who would argue there may never have been a deal at all if it weren't for Netanyahu, and whatever deal we got, he deserves some credit for. You know, the other discussion in America all the time, American Jews are always talking about, well, will the state of Israel attack Iran? Will it try on its own to wipe out any nuclear program that Iran may be developing in terms of a nuclear weapon? Two questions on this front, Raphael. Number one, does this deal put that entire question on the shelf? If, in other words, is it no longer a reason to discuss at all because we have at least 10, 15 years to worry about it? And in general, how do you feel about the uh, Israeli public's view of Israel trying to use military force to take out Iran's nuclear program? Mike, first of all, um to take out Iran's nuclear program is um, basically impossible for the Israeli army. Everything that the Israeli army can do is to set it back a couple of years. And Israeli generals are, are sorely aware of that. And uh, to come to your first question, they are thinking about all possibilities, keeping all options on the table, uh, thinking, of course, uh, you know, what needs to be done if something needed to be done. Uh, if Israeli intelligence were to signal that Iran is violating the agreement and seeking to break out the nuclear weapons capability, I am sure that the Israeli army would uh, seriously consider taking action to prevent that from happening. Having said that, um, the the military option seems um, very far away for, at, from, yes. from this point. Uh, 
if the Iranians are going to stick to the deal they signed yesterday, and my sense is that they will, at least initially for the first couple of years, to make sure that the sanctioning relief kicks in and they feel some economic relief. If the Iranians stick to the deal, then the, uh, the United States and Israel have no reason to attack military. If they haven't now, then they will certainly not once the Iranians scale back their agreement. I agree with Again, you. If the Iranians at some point make the uh, make a move to break out towards nuclear weapons capability, uh, Israel will will be attacked. Yes. Uh, okay. One more question for you, Raphael. We've discussed what the Israeli public, how the Israeli public views the deal, and what you've said is while there are nuances and differences, overall there may never have been an issue on which there is as great a consensus as there is in Israel over the fact that Iran should not have a nuclear weapon. When you look at this deal, you personally as an Israeli, what do you say to yourself? And when you talk to David about it, when you talk you know, with your friends about it, how, do you ever say to yourself, how in the world could the United States and President Obama think that this is the way that ultimately one should deal with Iran. How do you explain from your perspective how this came to be from an American point of view, in terms of the American administration? Right, Mark, my, Mark I, I honestly don't even think it's such a difficult question. From an American perspective, I understand why uh, this deal is uh, tempting. They wanted a deal. They wanted um, to have one foreign policy achievement in the Middle East, nothing else that the U.S. administration in the last couple of years in that region worked out, uh, and, and, and the U.S. administration and the Western powers that it partnered with really wanted to deal. Now, we here in Israel, we feel uh, the close proximity to Iran. We hear every day um, the anti-Semitic vitriol that's coming from Tehran uh, and its proxies here. We have... Uh, uh, thousands of rockets in the hands of Hezbollah pointed at our cities, so we feel it much more. And, and for the Jewish community, even in America, that's much more tangible than for policymakers in Washington who have other considerations. At the end of the day, Mark, every power, every country makes foreign policy decisions according to it, its best national security interest. And Clearly, the Obama, the Obama administration thinks that at this point it's, it's in the American interest to sign this deal. Israel clearly disagrees. But then the United States not alone, right? China, Russia, Great Britain, France, and Germany, one of Israel's uh, closest friends, you know, fully back that deal. So it's not just the American um, administration. It's also um, a large part of the entire international community who think that this is the right thing to do. Now, obviously, uh, um, I think it's a great mistake, uh, but it comes out of maybe a misunderstanding of the true nature of these, you know, evil regimes that we still hear with in the Middle East. Okay, you've said two things I want to make sure I give you a chance to comment on. One, you said that you saw the Obama administration motivated in an effort to get to, to have one major achievement, diplomatic achievement, in the Middle East. Then you talked about the fact that America does what is in its own uh, international self-interest. Well, mm -hmm. a, a political decision that an administration may make because it wants a success is different than saying it's in America's strategic interest to achieve it. They're, those are two very different things. By the way, they could be identical, but they're not necessarily identical. Right, and, but Mark, in the, in the eyes of policymakers in Washington, uh, of course, uh, they are identical, right? They want to get an achievement, but uh, if you ask Obama, is this a good deal, he's going to tell you it's a very good deal. And John Kerry is going to tell you it's an excellent deal, which is in America's best interest. Now, what motivates them to think that is a different question. I don't want to uh, engage in, in, in psychology or anything like that. Uh, if you ask me why do you think the Americans um, went for this deal and think it's a good deal, uh, it's because they think it's in their best interest. Why do they think that? Obviously, you can argue about this till tomorrow, because uh, um, 
it's very, you know, very hard to, to argue on something that there's no, you know, that you, you can't look up the answer in the book, right? The Israelis would say it's a bad deal, and the American administration tells you it's a good deal. <laughs> now, um, I hope that answers the a that little point, bit, a little right? Bit. About, yeah, about, uh, I do think the Americans think it's in their best interest. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't do that deal, right? And why do they? Why are they so convinced it's in the best interest of the free world when Israel thinks it's the opposite? So I think it's because you know uh, it, 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 they really wanted a deal badly. I think that's pretty obvious. They really wanted a deal. Um, and here they are, they got one. Okay, and I'm saying those two things are really very separate. You you want to conflate them. They should not be conflated. Do I think that President Obama and Secretary of State Kerry believe that this deal is in America's best interest? Probably yes. But that's different than saying, oh, they had to have a deal and therefore they're going to have a deal no matter what. And there are people in the United States who are claiming that that was the motivation of President Obama, that he so, mu he so much wanted a diplomatic win that he didn't care what price he paid. And therefore, critics here in America say, he was willing to take a deal which is really not in America's best interest because it did fulfill his other goal of giving him a victory that he could come on television and say to the American people, look, we made a major achievement here. That's a political victory. It does not mean it is necessarily in America's best international and national interest. And that's my only point. I want to make that distinction. And I think, I think you stumbled on something that's very important for Americans to deal with. And the second thing I wanted to ask you is, you say to me, some of Israel's best friends, and then you list all the countries that are in favor of this deal, including, you say, Germany, that is now a wonderful ally of the state of Israel, the irony of life, Raphael. And so somebody has a right to say to you, Raphael, you know, if everybody tells you you're drunk, at least sit down. In some way, if everybody is saying to you, hey, Raphael, this is a great deal, maybe you're wrong for thinking it isn't. And I want you to comment on that. Right. So there is some truth to what you're saying, but there's, uh, there's a difference, right? Because as I said, there, there's no objective truth, right? There's no answer in any book that we can look up whether this is a good deal or a bad deal. It depends on, on also threat perception, as we call it in Israel. For, for, for France and for China and for Russia, this is a good deal because, you know, we think we pretty much got the Iranians in check. For Israel, it's a bad deal because if, that, if there is a mistake and if the Iranians cheat, then we are going to be the ones suffering. And we are going to the ones who are going to have the Hezbollah rockets faced on our cities uh, if, uh, if at any point Iran wanted to activate its proxy in the region. So uh, I absolutely agree that if everybody tells you it's a good deal and you're the only one who thinks it's a bad deal, there is a reason to reflect. And, uh, and I can assure you that when the deal was published and as the details of the deals emerged uh, over the last few weeks, um, I warned myself against the knee-jerk reaction and I said, let's just not... Uh, belief of anybody tells you, let's read the deal, let's evaluate it, let's speak with nuclear experts, and let's, you know, make an objective uh, uh, evaluation of the deal, which is what I believe I did. Um, and I come to the independent conclusion that uh, for Israel, this is not a good deal, and that the U.S. should have tried harder to get a better deal. Uh, and I believe that it would have been possible to get a better deal. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Others might see that differently, and I understand why, because they don't see what I see. They are not living here in the region. They do not uh, feel so strongly about uh, the uh, Iranian um, aggressive actions here in the region, including proxies such as Hamas and Hezbollah and others here in the region. So, you know, um, I understand that the entire world thinks it's a good deal. I still think that Israel can think it's a bad deal, because we are, you know, in the line of fire. By the way, Raphael, you say it so beautifully, and it does have to do with personal experience and perspective. And what you're reminding all of us who are watching right now throughout America on JBS is that very often the American people 
American Jewry does not have the perspective that an Israeli has because the American and the American Jew does not have the experience you have. We are living an ocean away from you, and we're living in a very secure environment, and you live in a very different world, and everybody talks about, oh, what a difficult neighborhood Israel's in. But, you know, it, that kind of cliche does not really express or capture the very difficult situation Israelis must live with all the time. You do a remarkable job. The Israeli people do a remarkable job, Raphael, living with a certain kind of tension and anxiety, and then you live your life with a certain degree of joy and abandon and, and uh, an optimism into the future that is just breathtakingly inspiring. So I appreciate what you're saying very much. It's been wonderful having you on JBS. I hope you'll let us call you again. I wish you kol tuva haslacha. And again, wonderful insights. I thank you very much, Raphael. Thank you, Mark. You be Good well. Night. Be well. We'll talk again soon. The thoughts of Raphael Aaron, who is the diplomatic, co diplomatic correspondent for the Times of Israel. And again, uh, his last point if you live in a situation, you experience it first much more realistically and much more personally. And therefore, your positions may have more relevance and more weight. As always, we will continue to follow this discussion for you, the debate over the, the value, the merits of the Iran deal. And I hope that our discussion will help clarify some of your own thinking. My thanks to our director, Sloan Copeland. Production Coordinator Serge Goldberg, JBS Associate Director Dara Golub, and to the producer of this edition of In the News, Ron Jacobson. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.